Amen. Mark 13, 32 to 36 is where we're at this morning. So Mark 13, starting in verse 32. Jesus is speaking here. He says, But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to all, I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Well, we've made it to the end of Mark's version of the Olivet Discourse. It's what we call this section, Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13 here. The Olivet Discourse, because Jesus spoke it to his disciples when he was on the Mount of Olives, after he left the temple in Jerusalem. We've seen in verse 2, Jesus' prophecy of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which came to pass in 70 AD. We saw the question of the disciples in verse 4 about the timing and sign of these things. And from Matthew's version, we read that they were asking about the coming of Christ and the end of the age as well. We have seen Jesus repeatedly point out the fact to his disciples that they will have to go through much tribulation in this world as he reprograms their thinking with regard to his kingdom. We've seen that deception and wars and calamities and persecution will mark this age in which the gospel is to be preached to all nations. We've seen the sign of the destruction of Jerusalem, which points forward to more rebellion and tribulation. We have glimpsed the scene of the second coming of Christ and considered the parable of the fig tree and the two certain statements we find in verse 30 and 31. Now to cap off this discourse, Mark leaves us with some very clear application of the impending and unexpected second coming. So I'll have three points here as we consider this application. Number one, we don't know the time of the return. Number two, we have good illustrations of the return. And number three, we have the application of the return. So first of all, we don't know the time of the return. We see this in verse 32 and 33. Jesus says, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. So Jesus speaks here about the day or the hour. What is he referring to there? Well, he's referring back to the second coming, the return of Christ, the appearance or manifestation or revelation of Christ. As we read of it in verse 26, And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. This is the second coming of Christ at the end of the age. And Jesus says no one knows the day or the hour. No one knows the 24-hour period in which this will happen. We can't put it on a calendar. We can't date it. No one knows the hour, the, the smaller period of time within that day. He also uses the word time in verse 33. You do not know that when the time will come. That could be referring to a, a larger season or time. And so Jesus is saying that we don't know the time of his return. Jesus came a first time in his first advent, came in the flesh to redeem us at the cross. He died and rose again and ascended And he is currently installed on the throne as the reigning son of David. But he's returning one day. 
There will be a second advent, a return of Christ visibly, bodily, gloriously, very soon. He is at the very gates, as we saw last week. And at his return, we are told that in all the scriptures that the dead will be raised, the Christians will be changed and glorified in the twinkling of an eye, that the world will be judged by Christ, that every individual will be evaluated before the Son of Man, and that a new heavens and a new earth will be created. This is sometimes called in Scripture the day of Christ, because He will come on a certain day, a certain time. It is called the day of the Lord. Romans 2.16 says, On that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. In Philippians 1.6, Paul writes to the Philippians, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.2 says, For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. This is the day of Christ, the day of the second coming. And this is a key part of the Christian faith. We confess as Christians that this will happen. We put our hope in this future event, though we have not seen it yet, though it has not happened. We believe in it. We hope in it. We look forward to it, and we must be ready for it. But we do not know when it will be. It will come suddenly. It will come unexpectedly. Jesus says, no one knows here. This includes every person on the planet or who has ever lived. No one knows. You do not know when the time will come. And we see this emphasized even as you go down in verse 35. He says, therefore stay awake for you do not know when the master of the house will come. In the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning. In Acts chapter 1, verse 6 to 7, the disciples, who were still muddled in their understanding of the kingdom of God, asked Jesus, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? But then Jesus replied to him, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. See, we disciples are ignorant of this fact, the timing, the date of the second coming. It is not for us to know. The Father has fixed the time, but this is one of the secret things that belongs to the Lord and not to us. As Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. God has given plenty of things to understand and apply in His Word. Have you understood everything in this book and applied everything sufficiently to God's glory from this book? Well, if you haven't, then we have no business prying into things that God has not given us. We are to focus on these things and not look into dates of the second coming. Nevertheless, this passage here has not stopped many in church history from trying to predict the day or the hour or the time of the coming of Christ. Among the more famous are Irenaeus even, a a church father who apparently thought Jesus would return in 500 AD. That seemed to him a nice round number for Christ to come back in. Sir Isaac Newton, I learned, calculated that the end of the world would be in 2060. Well, maybe some of us will live to that time, see if he's right or not. John Wesley, leader of the Methodists, thought that the millennium would start in 1836. He had some calculation to come up with that date. And there have been many cultists, many cult leaders, who have made predictions about the time of the second coming. William Miller, founder of the Millerites, from which the Seventh-day Adventists broke off, He assigned October 22nd, 1844, as the day of Christ's coming. After this failed to happen, they called it the Great Disappointment, and many of his followers were disillusioned. Charles Taze Russell, 
the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses, said that Christ returned invisibly in 1874. Jehovah's Witness now believe that Jesus came invisibly in 1914. Joseph Smith, the founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or the Mormons, reported revelations that told him the end would happen within certain time periods, within his lifetime. Hal Lindsey, a popular evangelical of the last century, suggested that Jesus would return in the 1980s, probably no later than 1988. There was another book written at that time, I forget the author, but the book was titled 88 Reasons Why Jesus Has to Come Back in 1988. Jerry Falwell Sr. said in 1999 that the second coming would probably happen within the next 10 years. Jack Van Impey, maybe you've heard of him before, he still has a program. He made a number of predictions during his ministry of the date of the second coming. But he gave up after 2012, didn't bring the Lord's return. See, these predictions only continue to prove Jesus' statement here. No one knows the day or the hour. Some have thought they knew, but they were proven wrong. Jesus goes on to say here that not even the angels in heaven know that day or that hour. You think of these angels in heaven, these angelic messengers... They often bring to people in Scripture prophecies and the secrets of God, and they they are tasked with revealing these things to us. In Luke chapter 1, as you read the story of the incarnation, the, the, the birth of Christ, we see the angel Gabriel coming to John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, and he gives him the announcement of who John will be. And then he goes to Mary, and he tells Mary about the Christ who she would bear. We see him all the way back in Daniel. Gabriel in Daniel 9 brings Daniel the prophecy of the 70 weeks. These angels were often tasked with the secrets and the mysteries of God, yet they do not even know the day or the hour of Christ's coming. We see that they will be involved on that day. In verse 27, Of this chapter, we read that that Jesus will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. But even though they will be intimately involved in that day, they do not know the hour or the day of Christ's coming. But they are like good soldiers just waiting to be deployed at the right time. Jesus then goes on to give us An even more confounding statement. He says, nor the Son, but only the Father. Here is an amazing statement and maybe difficult for us to understand at first. Jesus says that even he himself, the Son of God, does not know the day or the hour of the second coming, but only the Father knows. Now we at this church, along with the historic Christian church, we believe in a triune God. We believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe in the three persons who are co-substantial, the same substance, essence, co-equal, co-eternal. We also believe that God is omniscient, that He knows all things that could possibly be known. So when we read that the Son, the Son of God, does not know something, we are immediately taken aback. What does this mean? How can Jesus be ignorant of anything? If he doesn't know something, does that mean that he is not God? Well, there's a rich history of reflection on the truth found in this verse. And we can only answer this when we understand a key doctrine about the two natures of Jesus Christ. See, we confess that Christ is truly human and truly divine. His divinity and humanity were joined at the incarnation, but not mixed so as to change their unique properties. Christ was not some kind of superman, some kind of half-human, half-divine person, but His divine nature remained divine with all its infinite perfections, and His human nature remained human with all its natural creaturely limitations. 
So how does this apply to his knowledge? Surely this is an area of mystery. When we consider the two natures of Christ or the hypostatic union, this is a mysterious doctrine. And we're not told every intricate detail about what this looked like in Jesus' experience. But with regard to the divine nature, we can say that the Son knew all things, that He was omniscient. And we see oftentimes in the Gospels that Jesus shows a knowledge of things that no one else had. John 2, 24 to 25, it says, But Jesus on His part did not entrust Himself to them because He knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man. For he himself knew what was in man. In John 21, verse 17, we see Jesus confronting Peter after his denial. And it says, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And so we see that from one perspective, with regard to his divine nature, we can say that the Son knows everything. We see examples of this divine knowledge in the Gospel of Mark, even Mark chapter 2, verse 6 to 8. It says, Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? He saw the hearts of men. He saw them questioning in their own thoughts. In Mark 11, verse 2, we see that he gives direction to his disciples to go and find the colt for him to sit on. And he knows exactly where it will be so he can direct his disciples. We see many other examples. Even you think of the predictions of his cross, his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. That he knew all that would happen to him beforehand. That he knew he would be betrayed. He knew he would be flogged. He knew he would be scourged. He knew he would be crucified by evil men. And that he would rise from the grave. Colossians 2.3, Paul says that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge So we need to retain that. We need to retain a high Christology in this regard. Christ did not give up his divine nature at any point. And yet he took upon himself a real human nature. Soul and body. Mind and will. We can say with regard to Jesus' human nature that he was increasing in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man throughout his childhood. Luke 2.52 says that. He increased in wisdom. And here in this verse we see that in the Father's wisdom, it was not his will for Jesus at this time in his human mind to access this bit of knowledge about the time of the second coming. Jesus often shows that he has access to divine knowledge and foreknowledge in the Gospels. But this verse shows that there could be things that were purposefully not revealed to him by the Father during his earthly ministry. Again, there is great mystery here. How Jesus' human mind interacted with his divine knowledge, I have no idea. (laughs) What it would be like to think like Jesus thought, it's an amazing mystery. But there's application in this. John Calvin said this, he says, And surely that man must be singularly mad who would hesitate to submit to the ignorance which even the Son of God himself did not hesitate to endure on our account. What is he saying here? If someone tries to figure out the date of Christ's second coming, when even Jesus said he didn't know it, when even Jesus submitted to that element of ignorance, well, then that man must be singularly mad, he says. I would say a person who assigns a date of the second coming is either 
ignorant of this teaching of this passage, or arrogant, or he's gone nutty. (laughs) He is singularly mad, as Calvin says. Often we see that people throughout history who have tried to do these kinds of things, tried to assign dates, they are often mentally ill. But there's another application of this. The Son of God endured this ignorance on our account, Calvin says. Christ took on Himself a human nature and endured normal life as a human being. He experienced tiredness, hunger, pain, and even lack of knowledge for our sake on account of us. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Philippians 2, 5 to 8 says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be exploited, but divested himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. See, Jesus, your Savior, came in your own likeness. He came in human form. He partook of all our human nature, without sin, of course, but in order that he might save us, in order that he might destroy the one who has the power of death, in order that he might go to the cross and obey the Father all the way there to die as a ransom for us all. Even this little bit of human ignorance we see in this verse should cause us to worship the Son of God for condescending for our sake. The Chalcedonian Creed says, Jesus is truly God and truly man of a reasonable soul and body, consubstantial with the Father, that means with the same substance, with the Father, according to the Godhead, and consubstantial with us, according to the manhood, in all things like unto us, without sin. Jesus is consubstantial with us. Think about that. He has the same substance, the same nature, The same essence as us in all things like unto us, even this lack of knowledge. So the condescension of the Son of God in the incarnation is incredible and we ought to worship Christ for this verse. Now the question comes up as we think about this, that that we are ignorant of the knowledge of the day or hour of Christ's coming. Why would the Lord keep this knowledge from us? Maybe we can't know for sure. Maybe we can't know all of why God has hidden this from us. But I think there are at least two reasons here. Think of a teacher who gives an exam at a certain date. And some of his students are diligent up to that date. And they prepare well in advance for the exam. But some are lazy. And they wait till the last possible day before the exam to study. And they don't do very well. Now, think of a teacher who gives pop quizzes once in a while. At random, that will gradually prepare the students for the exam. And he makes the quizzes count for a significant portion of the final mark. This would, in theory, compel all the students to be constantly and more frequently studying because they never know when a pop quiz will come. I think it's a bit like that. It's at least something there that if we knew the exact time of Christ's coming, maybe we would procrastinate with our work more than we do. We know that His coming will come unexpectedly, suddenly upon us, and this has the effect that we have to be ready at all times. Another reason may be, if you think of soldiers on a, in a battlefield, if the soldiers were encouraged to go full force and and that the victory could be near and could be quick, if they fight hard, well, they would fight and keep on fighting. But if they knew a battle would go on for four or five or six or ten years, maybe at some point along the way they would be tempted to say, I can't do this anymore. 
I can't do this for this much, much longer. They would grow discouraged. Maybe the Lord knows that we would grow discouraged if we knew the actual time, that it would be a longer wait than they thought in the first century. But whatever all the reasons, we can trust the Lord has kept this from us in His infinite wisdom and mercy. Now, Jesus tells us here to be on guard and keep awake, to be alert spiritually because of our ignorance and the unexpected timing of Christ's coming. And to help us to understand this readiness, He then gives us a parable. Even though we don't know the time of the return, Jesus gives us many illustrations in Scripture of the return and what our attitude ought to be in light of it. So my second point here is, we have good illustrations of the return, verse 34 to 35. They've said that a picture is worth a thousand words, and we know that to be true. Often an image or a picture or a story, an illustration will stick in your mind more than mere words. And Jesus was an illustrative teacher and preacher, and he gives us many illustrations of his return and what the time will be like when he returns, and the kind of readiness and preparation that we're to have regarding it. In Matthew 24, 37 to 39, he mentions how his coming will be like the days of Noah, where everyone was eating and drinking and marrying. It was business as usual, but then the flood came and suddenly destroyed all of them and swept them away. It was sudden and unexpected like the days of Noah. In Luke 17, 28 to 30, he adds that it'll be like the days of Lot in Sodom. Again there, people were eating and drinking and buying and selling, planting and building, but then fire suddenly came down from heaven and destroyed them all. This is what the second coming will be like. And then we have in Matthew 25, two different parables, the parable of the ten virgins and the parable of the talents. The first one pictures professing Christians as bridesmaids at a wedding who would wait for the bridegroom to come in the evening and go out to meet him with lamps. But five were foolish and did not come prepared with extra oil, so they ran out. But five were wise and came prepared so that they were ready to meet the groom and go into the marriage feast. That's another illustration of the second coming. In the parable of the talents, we see a master who goes on a journey and entrusts his servants with large sums of money. A talent was 20 years' wages for a laborer. He gives five talents to one, two to another, and one to another. The first two servants made more money with the money they had, but the last one did not. He just hid it and did nothing. The first two are commended by the master, but the last is rebuked for making no more. He is called wicked and slothful, and he is cast into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. All of these illustrations encourage a spiritual preparedness and busyness. The same with the parable we have here in Mark 13. Let's look at this for a few moments. Notice, first of all, the master in verse 34. It is like a man going on, on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. And then in verse 30, 35, he's called the master, who had come back at a certain time. Here is a man who has servants, a master, with people in his charge. But he leaves home, he goes abroad on a journey, and so he entrusts his servants with his property. This man represents, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, our master, our Lord. We are his servants, and he is currently away from us in a sense. Though he is with us to the end of the age, as he said in Matthew 28, he has ascended to heaven, and he is away from us in another sense. But after After his death and resurrection, he ascended to heaven and departed from his disciples in his bodily presence, but he will return one day and be seen by all. There's the master. Now notice also the servants. The servants are us, his disciples. We have been put in charge of Christ's assets that are on earth 
while he is away. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge. He's given his servants a certain authority. He's given all of us various positions of authority. He says also here that each of us has our own work, each with his work. We each have a particular calling in life, a particular work to do. We have particular relationships and callings and service to do in the church, to do in the world. It is in these things that we are called to be faithful servants. All the things He has put us in charge of and the work that He has given to each one of us to do. Maybe you're a husband or a wife, a mother, a father, a parent, a manager, a greeter or musician at church, a deacon or elder, a student, a teacher. Maybe you work in IT or at a lumber mill or various places. These are the things Christ has given us to steward and that we will give an account for. Notice the command then he gives to the doorkeeper. He commands the doorkeeper to stay awake, it says in verse 34. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. One of the servants here is the doorkeeper, and he's commanded to stay awake. Doorkeepers, of course, were tasked with keeping or watching the doors or the gates of a property through the watches of the night. So they were tasked to stay up in the night and watch and keep guard, to guard against trespassers and thieves who might come in and break in and steal. But what is said to the doorkeeper applies to us all. He applies it there in verse 35, therefore, stay awake. And as you notice those terms that he use, uses of the times, the evening, midnight, when the rooster crows, or in the morning, these refer to different watches of the night, late evening, midnight, then when the rooster crows, that term is actually a term that refers to the third watch, which is 12 to 3 a.m. I hope that no roosters are crowing 3 a.m., but then early, that word means the fourth watch, 3 to 6 a.m., so as the doorkeeper is commanded to keep guard through the watches of the night and not fall asleep and so neglect his duty and potentially endanger the master's household and be found by the master in such negligence, so we are commanded to stay awake in a like manner. We are all as disciples commanded to a spiritual alertness, liveliness, and readiness we don't want Christ to come back and find us sleeping on the job. Now, it's not a physical sleep he's talking about, obviously, here, but a, a spiritual sleep, a kind of laziness in Christ's service, succumbing to sin, susceptible to lies and the attacks of Satan in the flesh. It's not a physical alertness or preparedness that he's talking about. He's not saying you have to be a prepper and stock your apocalypse bunker. No, he's talking about being spiritually awake. That you have to be alert, busy in your service to Christ, guarding your heart from the flesh, the world, and the devil. We are given charge of things and commands as Christians. We are given jobs to do, worship and discipleship and mission we are to keep these commandments unstained and be fruitful in them. We are to honor Christ in all of life as we each go to our own work. And we are told to watch and to be careful, fighting the flesh, the world, the devil, not being carried away by sinful desires or civilian affairs or deceived by Satan. We are not to fall asleep. We should be lively and alert in the faith at all times not letting our love for God or one another grow cold. Look at a few other scriptures on this. We'll turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. <clears throat> 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 11. <clears throat> now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, 
For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. So Paul encourages us to be ready, to be sober and sober-minded, to put on the armor of God in light of that day. Now turn also to 2 Peter chapter 3. In verse 14, right after he talks about the new heavens and new earth, he says, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. We are to be unblemished by sin without spot or blemish. And we are to be at peace with one another. That's how we want to be found by Him. Do you want Christ to come back and find you indulging in unrepentant sin, blemished by anger, yelling at your kids? Do you want Christ to come back and find you looking at immoral things? Do you want Christ to come back while we're in the middle of a church split or division, while you're not reconciled with your husband or wife or other fellow believers in Christ? Do you want Christ to come back while you're not sharing the gospel out of cowardice? See, he calls us to be without spot or blemish and at peace, to have his armor on at all times. It's maybe like a teenager whose mom and dad goes out for an evening and he tells the teenager (coughs) to do the dishes and not play too many video games. But they come home earlier than expected. And what is he doing? He's sitting on the couch, and the dishes are not done. That is not how we want to be found. We want to be found in Christ, abiding in Him, diligent in His service. In Matthew 24, 45 to 51, he gives a similar parable, and he speaks of a wicked servant who says in his heart, my master is delayed. And so he begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards. But the master comes back when he does not expect it. And he cuts him in pieces and puts him with the hypocrites where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, we're not to live in drunkenness or anger towards one another. If the Lord finds us living in such sins, living on in unrepentant sin when he comes back, It will be to our judgment, and we will be thrown into eternal hell. Romans 13, 11 to 14, Paul says this, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. How much more near is it now, friends? And Paul says, the night is far gone, the day is at hand, so then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires." So true Christians are those who, while far from perfect, out of love for the Lord, we seek to obey Him in this life. We take these words seriously. We put off sin. We put off the old self. We fight it, and we work for Christ, and we do good works, and we make no provision for the flesh. 
1 John 2, verse 28, puts it another way. 1 John 2, 28, he says, And now, little children, abide in Him, so that when He appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from Him in shame at His coming. See, this is really about abiding in Christ. It's about living in Christ and for Christ. And that is a joyous life. It's a light, easy yoke of resting our souls in Him. It's a diligent life, to be sure, because Satan is prowling around. And the world is so persistent. And our own flesh rises up against the Spirit. The Christian life is not a lazy life. And it's sometimes a painful life. But undergirding all that effort is this abiding in Christ, in His grace, in His strength, in His joy, in His love. We abide in Him. We remain in Him. And so we can prepare ourselves and be ready and confident at His second coming. Friends, sometimes we do get drowsy and sleepy in our Christian life. Often when I'm driving for a long distance, I find I get sleepy. It's inevitable. So I'll do various things. I have various tools at my disposal to keep myself awake. Sometimes it's loud music or an interesting audiobook or spits, the seeds. You can eat them and they keep you kind of awake. As a last resort, I might even try an energy drink, though I don't commend those to you because they're unhealthy. But we as Christians also, we have many tools at our disposal to keep us awake. The Scriptures... Daily Bible reading and prayer, constant prayer to the Lord, constant confession and recourse to Him, constant trust in Him. We have other means of grace. We have the church family. We have the correction and encouragement from brothers and sisters in the church membership and pastors and their sermons. All of these things remind us that we are Christ's servants bought with the price of His precious blood, so we are to live to please Him now in this age before He comes. So we have tools at our disposal to keep us awake. Friends, this is a very helpful truth to remind ourselves often. This unexpected return of Christ. It's a good measuring stick or thermometer for our spiritual life. Think to yourself right now. Is my thought life in the condition I would want Christ to find it in? Are there consistent attitudes in my life that are out of accord with His will and that would dishonor Him when He comes? Married people think, am I living with my spouse in a way that Christ would be pleased with when He returns? Parents think, would I want Christ to return and see the way that I'm dealing with and speaking to my kids right now? Is my service to my church and my community the way I want it to be when Christ returns? Would I want Christ to return and examine my current evangelism efforts? See, this is a helpful way to examine what we're doing right now. What would we be doing differently as individuals and as a church if we knew that Christ was coming back in even two weeks or a month? But He's very near. He's at the very gates. So this is meant to be helpful. Do not let these thoughts condemn you. Remember that Christ died for you and He loves you and He's living in you to empower you so that you don't have to walk in shame and guilt. You are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Whenever we're not acting as we should be, we go back to the Lord, we ask His forgiveness and His empowering grace. And then we make diligent efforts toward holiness and godliness as we abide in His love and grace. See, we are not destined for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. You are not justified by your works. You're not going to be shut out of Christ's kingdom for any sins and failures. But if you're one of His, you will take this passage seriously and out of love serve Christ and ready yourself for His coming. So think of this. Think of these images as you go out of church today. Think that Christ will come suddenly and unexpectedly like the judgment of the flood or Sodom and Gomorrah. Think of yourself like wise bridesmaids with extra oil prepared. 
Think of yourself like faithful servants who multiply the master's talents and are given authority, each with your own work while he's away on a journey. Think of yourself as doorkeepers, keeping watch, not falling asleep and neglecting your duty. Jesus gives us these illustrations for our aid. Now, sometimes when the doctrine of the second coming and eschatology comes up, people get into all kinds of rabbit trails of debates and vain discussion that is not helpful to anyone's souls, and even division and anger, which Christ will not be pleased with when he returns. But these things are not written for us to engage in predictions or foolish theories or controversies, but rather this is a highly relevant and practical doctrine for our life. See, we have the application of the return of Christ. Verse 37, Jesus reiterates this. He says, in what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. That is the big application here. Jesus tells us, be on guard, stay awake. Like the doorkeeper, stay awake. What I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. He calls us to this spiritual readiness. Some of you are not awake yet. You are still dead and sleeping in your sins. And when Christ comes back very soon, if you are still in that state, you will not be ready. And you will be thrown into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so this passage should come to you and say, come awake. You're not awake yet, so come alive to Christ. Let Christ shine on you. Wake up. Escape from the present evil age. Look to Christ. Look to His blood shed for sinners on the cross. Look to His gift of free grace which can be yours by simple faith in Christ. Confess your sin and return to Christ before he returns to judge the world in righteousness. But for those of us who are awake, who have been given spiritual life by Christ, we are to stay awake. We are to keep our eyes open, looking to Christ. We are to keep a close watch on our hearts, on our lives, on our doctrine, We are to guard against the world, the flesh, and the devil. We are to keep watch by staying in the word and prayer and all the means of grace. Friends, think more often about the second coming. Think often about Christ who died for you and is returning for you. The church must ready herself with holiness and godliness like a bride prepares for her wedding day. We want to glorify Christ every day and on the day of his return. So keep awake, stay on guard, so that he may not find you sleeping on that day. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, that you've kept certain knowledge from us, but you've given so much to us, Lord. We thank you for this passage, for the doctrine of Christ and his atonement and his resurrection and his ascension and his second coming. Lord, we pray and ask that you'd help. Help us to stay our minds on these things and help us to be awake and to stay awake. Lord, that we would be spiritually prepared on the day when Christ returns and we pray Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.